On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Carmela, and Carmela was married to a misogynistic, narcissistic abuser. It's a story of pushing boundaries, jealousy, entitlement, physical abuse, custody, and post-separation abuse. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Carmela. How are you? I'm good, Brandon. Thank you. you? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. And if you want to be a guest like Carmela is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also, we haven't been getting a lot of reviews lately, so if you want to give us a review on Apple or Spotify or whatever whatever podcast service that you use, please give us a nice glowing review or written review as well. It helps out the show a lot when it comes to rankings. So if you have time to do it, please do that for us. And today we have a content warning for this episode as we do discuss physical abuse in this episode, graphic depictions of physical abuse and threats to Carmela's life. So that is your content warning for this episode. And a big thank you to Carmela for being here with us today. This recording was actually erased by mistake, and I'm thankful Carmela came back to re-record with me. So now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Carmela, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see, where do, where do I begin my crazy story? I think that you like to start with like early childhood. So basically what my dad was abusive, he was physically abusive. He was emotionally abusive, mentally abusive. He played a lot of mean tricks on us. He physically hit us. We were three girls. Um, he, like, we had to be perfectionists. You know, I remember like the slightest little mistake and he would just, you know, slap us. Like if we ate, if we used our fork and knife wrong, it was like, boom, you know, so there was a lot of abuse. Um, He also abused my mom. So we witnessed that as well. And, you know, um, it was just like no support. My mom was very loving, but she was also like afraid of him. So it, it was a difficult, a really difficult time. And my whole, like, uh, my whole point was to get out of there, you know? So like, I, as soon as I was like a teen, I was just never home. So, um, you know, ironically, my beliefs were very like romanticized about relationships. I was like, oh, I can't wait till I get like my own husband, my own family. I'm going to have kids and, you know, I'm going to do it right. So like I had a strong focus on, you know, the happily ever after, the whole Cinderella um you know, a fairy tale, because I think when you're abused, you really look for things like that. You look like fairy tales mean even more to you. Do you know what I mean? Like I could picture being a really healthy child with, you know, parents who love and support them and respect them. And I could picture that daughter not being as impressed by Cinderella's story (laughs) than somebody who's, you know, abused and battered and put down and then all of a sudden Cinderella's story seems like oh my god you know yeah so at a young age like I I you know I dated in high school but nothing serious and then because I wasn't really allowed to my dad was like super strict but then when I was um about 22 I met this young guy he was 20 and we fell deeply in love like we had a really strong love connection he, but he was um, a different religion. He was American, but his parents were not, you know, so he's just like me, first generation. And, um, you know, we got along great. We were like, 
amazing together. We were very strongly in love. And then as soon as we got married, everything changed. And he wanted me to become religious. And, you know, every all the things that we had discussed prior to getting married that he promised I wouldn't have to do. Um, when we got married, all of a sudden he wanted me to do. And like, I also had my own business for like high profile people in Manhattan. And, um, you know, I had 50% of my clients were men, like executives, NBA stars, you know, like big, big talents. And he was like, you're not allowed to touch men anymore. It was just like nothing. Where my neighbor was my friend since I was five. And one day he said hi to me and he like literally went nuts. Like I thought he was going to hurt me that night. So little by little, I, I realized I had to get out of that relationship. And that was like 12 years we were together. So after that relationship, what is your life like? And when do you end up meeting the person that the story is about? Yeah, so after that relationship, I was kind of dating. I was like in my 30s by now. And I was always like innocent because I told you my dad was very strict. So like, I didn't really have that many, you know, in quote lovers or whatever. So I think during that time, I was like exploring a little bit, dating a couple of guys, you know, different types of men and just seeing like what it was like, you know, with this and what it was like with that. But um, then I met this this guy who's from my country, who's, who's, who's Italian. And we just really hit it off. He was um, he was a professor um, at NYU, and he would come um, for about eight months out of the year to teach at NYU. And he had a, an apartment in the village in Manhattan. And, you know, we were like almost inseparable. I was trying to forget about my ex-husband, you know, my first husband. Um, and I thought, this is perfect. I won't get attached. He's going to go back to Italy. You know, this is great. This is a perfect person. But when he went back to Italy, he was he started, like, love bombing me. This guy is probably another narcissist. And then when he came back to New York, we started up again. And then he asked me to move in with him. And But he wasn't going anywhere. And I, like, my goal was marriage and children. So after about three years with him, I broke it off because... I realized that he's more of, um, I guess if you have to put a word to it, like a playboy. He wanted, he enjoyed being with, you know, he probably had somebody in Italy too. I, I don't know that, but I'm assuming. And um, he just didn't want to commit. So I left him. Um, and now I'm like towards my, you know, later 30s. <laughs> I was probably like 36, 37. And I was working at a company where I met, the, the guy that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and we were in the same department. And so when I broke it off with the Italian guy, he was like my friend. Well, he was my friend. So he like consoled me. And he was very like, very, very charming. Really supportive. He was like, you're so beautiful. I can't believe he didn't get married to you. He's so stupid. You know, like all the things that someone wants to hear when when they're sad. Um, and then he like took me out and just was like, Hey, let's just have fun. Don't think about it. And meanwhile, he was engaged. Um, but he would tell me during these outings together, how he was unhappy, how she was crazy. She was very jealous. She was not social. She just wanted them to stay in and hold up in the apartment. Um, that's not his style. Um, she, you know, all these things of how crazy she is, but it was really focused on how jealous she was. And, um, and you know, I, I would try to recommend that, and he was like, I think I'm going to break off the engagement. And he had told me, like, he was engaged, like, four times, <laughs> you know? So that should have been a clue. But, you know, when you're, I don't know, I guess when, when you're just, they always say hindsight is 50-50, so... So anyway, um, I had encouraged him to stay with her because I was like, well, if you loved her enough to give her a ring, like you must love her. So why don't you try to work it out? And he was like, nope, nope, not going to do it. She's crazy. She's nuts. And I didn't think much of it. But um, anyway. So you're in this vulnerable spot here. You are also feeling like you want to start having a family and that's a really big priority for you. And then you eventually have an accident. 
and I will spare everyone from hearing the details of this accident so they don't get the visual of it. But the doctor said that there was this possibility that they might have to amputate your arm and you were really, really scared. So you wanted someone with you, and within this situation, it really didn't matter to you who it was. Obviously, you wanted friends and family, but um, it didn't matter to you at this point. So tell us what happens from here. So I was freaking out, and I was trying to call like anyone I knew because I was really afraid, and I didn't want to be there alone. So, like, I called my family. Most of my family was in Italy at that time. But I, my one sister's here. She was in school. I called all my friends. No one was answering their phone. It was, like, one of those nights. And um, and I called him. Like, he was literally my last resort because I was terrified. So I was like, you know, I hate to be annoying, but do you think that you could come meet me at the hospital? I don't know what's going on, and I don't want to be here alone in case they have to operate. You know, like, I, I don't know what's going on. So he came, like, right away. He was there within 20 minutes. It was just like, boom, like as soon as I hung up. And he was so concerned and loving and, you know, he made me laugh. And don't worry, you're going to get through this. Long story short, thank God they didn't have to do anything major. They were able to remove it. It it had a a ball at the end, so it was rounded. And um, they just had to like do a couple of stitches. So everything was fine. My sister came by that time. He introduced himself, like, again, very charming, took us home, you know, took us to eat something, took us home. He was kind. Like, so anyway, um, a couple of months, like maybe a couple of months passed, uh, maybe two. It wasn't that much longer, maybe a month. I don't even remember now. But anyway, when I got back to work and we started hanging out, I said, hey, listen, you know, I'd like to do, you know, I'd like to pay you back, you know, repay you. You know, I would like, maybe I'll take you off. And he was like, no, date me with me. And I was like, but like, I was so taken aback because he's engaged still, but he was like insisting. And I said, I'm sorry, you're technically engaged, even though you're telling me you, you he was telling me they don't sleep together. They don't talk. They're in separate rooms. I was like, so even though you're saying all this, you're still engaged and living with her. So I'm going to pass. Eating. And um, he like immediately broke it off with her, moved out with his friends. It's one of his closest friends. So he moved out with this guy. And about six months after that, maybe seven or eight, you know, we, we were still friends. He had a party. And, um, and I went with a few of my friends and he, you know, asked me again. He's like, all right, well, now it's been like six, seven months that I'm living here. I've been broken up with her for, you know, eight, nine months. Can we please just go on one date? So I did because he was, I asked, you know, I even asked my friend, I remember asking, like, what do you think? And because he was so nice and he was like nice to my friends. I mean, I can't tell you, my friends loved him. Um, One of my friends later remarked how, because her sister was dating a guy for 10 years and he never proposed like they were just dating. And my ex proposed within six months of us dating. And so later on, my friend would remark like, wow, he's a man. He knows what he wants, you know, like, look at him. He's not like that loser my sister's dating for 10 years. So anyway, so we went on this date. It went really perfect. It was like the perfect date. He was a perfect gentleman, kind, funny, charming, pulling out the chairs, paying the bill, like all that. Took me somewhere really nice. Um, we had great conversation. We felt, I felt like we kind of had similar backgrounds uh, because we went to Catholic school, whatever. It was like a lot of similar stuff, like neighborhood. We both grew up in an Italian neighborhood, even though he wasn't Italian. And um, I just felt very like, okay, you know, like, all right, we are very similar. We have a similar background. Um and it just like from there went really fast. Like within six months, he proposed. I wasn't ready, but it was done in in a place I felt like I, I was uncomfortable to say, oh, no, I'm not ready. You know, he surprised me one day at, at a restaurant that I had expressed was like my dream to get proposed in. It's a very romantic beautiful high-end restaurant in in Brooklyn, but it oversees Manhattan. It's on the water. Like, um, 
whatever. So he took me there and he proposes to me like in front of everyone and had to wait or like take pictures while he was doing it. So it was like, I couldn't say, I, you know, I was so uncomfortable. I'm a people pleaser. I was so uncomfortable to say, oh, excuse me. I'm not sure, you know. So I said yes. And, um, you know, whatever. We got engaged that night. And it was, it, it is what it is what it is. Like we were, I guess he was happy. I was very confused. I was a little scared. But I thought, you know what? I'll have a long engagement. Um, so when I expressed that to him, I was like, wow, this was super fast. Like, you know about a week later, I told him like, this was really fast. Maybe we should just, you know, have a long engagement. And he was like, oh no, because he was a couple years older than me. He was like three or four years older than me. So I think four years. So he was now 40 and he was like, oh no, like I'm, you know, I, if we're going to have a family, like we got to start now, like I'm 40. And, you know, the reasoning behind that was, it made a lot of sense to me. You know, he was 40 and I was 36. So it was like, well, yeah, we're going to have to get married soon. So, um, so I kind of went. Hi, everyone. This episode is sponsored by Cozy Earth at CozyEarth.com. And Cozy Earth has all things bedding. It's pretty luxurious. Their best-selling bamboo sheet set is temperature regulating, very soft. It was on Oprah's favorite things of 2018. Yes, that Oprah. And they also have some pretty awesome loungewear there, too. And being a show about abuse, I am always advocating for self-care as part of the healing process. Not the whole thing, but part of it, especially when it comes to sleep because sleep is a big issue for me having the right combo of pillows the thin one the thick light one the thick heavy one you know flipping them to get that chilled side these things are important you know sleep is important being comfy when you sleep is important so with cozy earth you can create a little sanctuary for yourself from pillows to sheets blankets they have a generous warranty some might say it is a luxury to have such things but to me cozy earth can help provide comfort for you and peace of mind Cozy Earth is providing the Narcissist Apocalypse community an exclusive offer today, up to 35% off site-wide when you use the code NAP, N-A-P. So explore CozyEarth.com today for the latest in bedding and loungewear. So right now you're seeing two different people, and I'm sure that's really hard to figure out for you in one way. He's this romantic, chivalrous person, a savior in a way on that day, you know, when you were hurt. But he's also pushy and, he, you know, persistence isn't always a good thing. But he's showing that he's also pushy, that he uses wanting you to, like, have a family to be pushy and move past your boundaries. You know, we're getting older, he says. So if you were younger, this may not have happened. This the situation might not have happened, but you know, you're older and you know, there's a partial truth. You were kind of getting older, and he's using it to really push down your boundary there to get what he wants. And you were uncomfy about this, but it makes sense to you at the same time. There are these two conflicting thoughts that are going on, and it's a lot to process. But also before we continue. I really wanted to get to talk about his family. So let's talk about his family and really get a better sense of where he came from. Yeah, yeah. So basically, his parents had like the worst relationship you could imagine. All they did was scream at the top of their lungs at each other, but over everything, like even the phone ringing, it was bad. Like it was, I remember thinking, ugh, but he was like, oh, yeah, they've been like that forever. And they, you know, they're still together. And it's been like, I don't know, past 60 years because I went to their 60th anniversary. So, you know, in time, the mom really got to like me and confide in me. She, you know, I don't know how to say it, but they raised a whole bunch of crazies. Like the oldest, they had two daughters first and then 10, 11 years went by and then they had two sons. So. The oldest daughter is, is, is nice, but she's just like wacky, you know, very, very wacky. She has a, like, drive on the side, do this, do that. Like, first of all, they're all bullies. They're all controlling every single one of them. 
I remember talking to my brother-in-law once about the second oldest sister. Well, I wasn't talking about her. I was talking about my husband. And and I was like, I, I don't know if I can keep doing this. He's so bossy. And he goes, oh, I think my wife beats him in that department. And it's just, that's how they all were. They were all bossy. Um, they all know more than you. They're all the best. <laughs> They're all the smartest. They all know the right way. And you have to do it their way. So, but yeah, the parents had a horrible relationship. And the father was particularly macho and lazy. Like he did nothing. He used to just sit down and expect you to serve him hand and foot. And um, and the mom was, she'd do it, but bitch about it. You know, she would be like, I can't believe it. He's so annoying. I can't believe I have to do this. But she would do it. You know what I mean? So it, it they got used to that pattern. Like, all right, I'll be, an, I'll be an idiot and a macho guy and she'll continue to do what I want, but she'll bitch about it. You know what I mean? And they just continued like that. Um, but when she confided in me, she told me that he's, he did horrible things when, when they were younger, um, before the boys came around. But anyway, yeah, they, they had a really bad relationship, the parents. And the one thing is that he had a lot against the mother and the sisters. He would always say, my mom's a liar. My sisters think who they are. My mom um, always cursed. But his dad and his brother, he never said one word about. He never said one word about them. So eventually you end up getting married. So what happens from here? So we got married and... You know, we had a nice wedding. Um, we were on a boat, like, going around Manhattan. And it was really pretty. It was really nice. Um, you know, things turned out well. And then, like, I would notice that he would he was always outside with his friends. Like, this was his big thing. Like, he wanted, I wanted a small wedding, a dinner. He wanted a big, huge wedding because, you know, he has all these friends from high school. He was always... He was still friends with, from all, with all his friends from high school, like at 40. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's, it's wonderful if you all grow up and, you know, um, mature. But, like, they kind of acted like they did when they were in high school. So all his friends were there, and they were all outside smoking pot, like outside the boat, not in because the boat had, like, an inside part that was our ballroom type area. And then... And then they, you know, there there was the outdoors. So they were always outside smoking pot constantly. And honestly, I was very embarrassed. Um, my family, you know, I'm sure they noticed and they were like, like, what the heck is going on? This is his wedding. And he's never in, in the room with her. So, so I was really uncomfortable. But I chalked it up to he was just having a great time. This is his dream. This is his dream, you know, because he kept telling me that. So I was like, all right, let him have fun. So after the wedding, you go on your honeymoon, and when you get back home, you told me in our previous call that he starts to become jealous. Every time your phone rang or you got a text, he would be grumpy and mean, and eventually you had to give him the password to your email, allow him to read all of your texts. He went through your entire Gmail account, too, and you told me that you passed this off as insecurity. But the cumulative of these things right now has been really that he's pushy, he's bossy, he's a boundary breaker. Now this jealousy is getting added here. Control is happening here. Privacy breaking is happening here. Things have really moved fast. You're uncomfy, but you still know what he was like as this loving person at the beginning of the relationship. So there could be a benefit of the doubt that's still going on here. And you always wanted to have a baby. So eventually, this being a really big thing, you do try to have a family. So what happens from here? And then we tried to have a family right away because obviously, you know, he was 40. I was now like 30. And we tried for about a year. And, um, you know, I didn't get pregnant. But, you know, at the time I had gone, we, we had very, very good insurance. We had like top A, amazing insurance. And so it paid for everything. Um, and I was able to see whatever doctor I wanted. So I Googled like the best um, uh, doctors uh, that help people become pregnant. I, I always forget their name. They have a special name. But I, I Googled, you know, like the best of that. And um, 
I went to like the top guy in Manhattan. And I guess because he's at that level, when I went for the first meeting, I didn't meet with him. I met with his like PA and the PA like sent me for all these tests and some of them were really invasive. Anyway, after the test, all the results came in, then I have a meeting with the doctor. So when I went to have the meeting with the doctor, he was like, I'm sorry, why did you come here and do all these tests? And I was like, well, I, you know, my age and I, I never had, I was never pregnant. And, you know, I really, really want to have a baby quickly because my age. And he was like, yep, nothing wrong with you. There's no reason why you shouldn't get pregnant. If you try, you know, if you do it the right way, like you time it with your cycle. Um, he, he said, um, you know, that I have plenty of eggs. They're in great condition, et cetera, et cetera. No blockages. <laughs> so I was like, all right, great, you know. But it was a year and I didn't get pregnant. So I like we, we tried, but I never really did that method thing. So I started doing the method of after my, um, you know, cycle and stuff. And like six, eight months passed, you know, another birthday passed and I'm still not pregnant. I'm like, this is crazy. What's going on? So when I mentioned it to the doctor, he was like, have your husband come in. So, you know, I had to convince him because he's very macho. But finally he went. And the results came back that he had a condition uh, called azuspermia where he cannot um, have children. So it was like devastating. It was like a devastating blow to me because here I am like, you know, having that dream, that Cinderella dream in my head of family, kids. And, you know, it's funny because you take a lot of mistreatment because of what you think you want, you know? like I mean, I always wanted children, but I'm saying... Because of that, I took a lot from him. And now here I am, you know, facing the fact that uh, he can't have children. And now I'm like, I think at this point I was 38. And I was like, oh my God, like, what the heck? What am I going to do? So I was devastated. And um, and I told him, like, would you be okay if we used um, donor sperm? And he was like, no, 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 no way. I have to be to be on. And so I was like, well, it's not fair that you would be stopping me. I'm sorry. So, um, you know, even though I love you, I, I gave you an option and you're not accepting it. I'm going to have to like probably leave because I only have like, you know, small window now. Now I have to find somebody else. You know, it's like I have a very small window. And um, anyway, needless to say, he came around. He didn't want me to go. So he said, um, you know, we could use donor sperm, but on one, like on one or two conditions. And the main one is he said, like, if I told anybody, he would kill me. He's like, I would kill you and I would kill the baby if anyone found out. So don't forget, I was living with that fear like the whole time. But anyway, like an idiot, I said, okay. I, I don't even know, you know, when you think back, I'm like, why would I agree? Like, why would I allow somebody to threaten me like that, you know? And he was serious. Like, um, he would say things like, if you ever cheated on me, I'd punch you so hard in the throat, you'd probably die. Like, that's how you talk to me. And thinking back, I'm like, how did I allow that? Like, what would make me think that a person who could say that to me loves me or, or it's okay to be with them? I have no idea. I can't even answer that. Because it's 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 embarrassing, but that's what he that's how he would talk to me. So, um, he's, and then the second thing was that I had to choose like from somebody who looked exactly like. So I tried, you know, I picked somebody with similar coloring, height, you know, and um, and I and I like had like a little um, conversation with God, and I was like, hey, listen, like I'm gonna try this once. And if it works, wonderful. If it doesn't, I don't think I'm trying again. Like, I really didn't want, I don't know. I was just in a weird place. And so anyway, we tried it one time. I didn't use anything frozen. I just, everything was fresh. Like, I I was very, like, weirded out, I guess, by the process. We tried it, and right away I got pregnant. Like, literally right away. So I was so excited, you know, when I found out I was crying. I was so happy, like, all my life. All I wanted was a baby, like, so, so excited. And uh, he was happy. And, you know, we had, oh, by the way, we had agreed to not tell anybody until I was five months because um, they said that after 35, 
a lot of women lose the baby within the first five months. So I was like, you know what, let's just wait until I'm five months and then we'll tell people. And he agreed with that. Later, I found out he told all the men in his family and all the men in my family on secretly that I'm pregnant, but she doesn't want to tell anybody until she's five months. So please act like you don't know. And, and, and um, you know, so again, like just no respect for anything that I, I ask. But anyway, um, at five months, I started telling people I gave birth to a healthy son who's, you know, the light of my life. And um, I was so happy and elated. But when I had him, um, the doctors had recommended I do a C-section because they said that the cord was wrapped around his neck three or four times. It was my only surgery I ever had, so it hit me hard. Um, and at the same time, because before we decided on C-section, I was pushing, I had had a hemorrhoid, so I had, two days later, I had to have a hemorrhoidectomy, I think it's called, so which was like two major surgeries within two days, and I was, I kind of had severe edema, and I was not in like the best place, so I needed some help. Um, but really quickly before that, like, so here I am, like after surgery, and they send in all the paperwork that has to be filled out the next morning. So I was like out of it, you know, I was on pain medication. I couldn't get out to bed and he filled everything out. He named my son, didn't ask me what I want him to be named. He named him after himself, who's, who he's named after his dad. And, um, you know, and I mentioned, I was like, wait, you did everything? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, you, you, you put his name down already? He's like, yeah. And I was like, I, I wanted to name him something from my culture because it's that's important. My culture, I'm very tied to my culture. My parents were first generation and they instilled a lot of my culture in all of us. So it was important for me to include an Italian name. And he was like, no, you know, he said, if it was a girl, I could have done whatever I wanted. So, but because it was a boy, he was going to, you know, take control. So whatever, that was that. Then um, we get home and I needed help because I was in a real, you know, like I had two surgeries. I was just not well. And um, I, my mom was kind enough to help me because she lived nearby. So she would come and stay most of the day, help me, and then, you know, go home at night kind of thing. And he was always annoyed. He always, like, he made her feel so unwelcome. Like, I can't explain you know that feeling where you're tense in a room with other people like it was like that like he just made her feel unwanted unwelcomed uncomfortable and I hated that you know it's like first of all it's my mom second of all she's like if you know my mom she's like the nicest person in the world so there's that and it's just and you know what's funny is he would say to me all the time before you know his true self came out he would say you're the nicest person I've ever met. No one's like you. Because we're just like, my mom made us, I always tell my mom, you made us too good. You should have made us a little bit, you know, bad because this world is tough. So like, we're very kind people and we really give of ourselves, you know, like um, like naturally, like we don't expect anything back. And he would be like, he, he, he started using this term with me, pick up the golf ball because if someone did me a favor, I'd want to repay them like 10 times. He was like, just pick up the ball and leave. Just pick up the ball. I don't know what the exact saying is, but something about picking up the golf ball. And I guess it goes back to a golf game. But um, he's like, you don't know when to pick up the ball and go. You always have to give. You always have to give. Why do you have to give? That was his whole thing with me later on. But in the beginning, he was like, you're such a nice person. And the same with my mom. Your mom's so nice. All of a sudden, nasty mean to her, made her uncomfortable. Um, and then he at night he would be like, is she coming tomorrow? Is she coming tomorrow? I'm like, yes, because I need help. I can't even walk yet. You know, it's going to take a couple of weeks. Anyway, and he did nothing. He didn't change diapers. He didn't clean. He didn't cook. So I didn't know what he expected, you know, unless he was able to hire a nanny or something, which he, he, he never had any money. So anyway, um, my mom came, whatever. And then sometimes my sister would come to make me like these smoothies to help with the edema. And he would be so nasty to her too. Like, I felt so uncomfortable. Like, why is he doing this to my family? And all they're doing is helping me. Anyway, um, I got better. Um, oh, and then with the breastfeeding, 
he was obsessed that I breastfeed because he was so scared of paying for formula. Like he was obsessed. Like he was psycho about it. Like, okay, it's time to pump, time to pump. And I'm like, wow, like he's, he, he wasn't like that about anything. And then all of a sudden, and then I realized it was because he didn't want to pay for formula. So his toxic masculinity, his bullying, not taking responsibility, his sense of entitlement is really showing here. And eventually you experience physical abuse for the first time. So walk us through this. So one time when I was breastfeeding my son, we were having an argument or something. And he got so mad, he put his his hands around my neck, like to choke me. And he and he like pushed. It wasn't like he just put them around gently. And my eyes like popped out of my head. I was so upset. And I guess he caught himself and he like like released for a second. And I just took my son and I ran out of the house. Um you know, again, like a fool, I didn't call the police. I called his mom. I don't, I don't even know why I did that, but I was so angry and so scared, but I didn't, like, I felt like if I called the police, my whole life would change. He would be arrested. And I, I just wasn't ready for that, I guess. So I called his mom and I told her like what he did. And, you know, she was upset and all that, whatever. But you know, and she said she would speak to him, but, you know, speaking to him is is futile because he, he never listened to anybody except for himself. But that was the first time that, like, he put his hands on me. And um, I never told my mom. I didn't tell anybody in my family. I didn't even tell anyone in his family. I just told his mother. So it's not like I told his sisters or in-law. I literally just told his mom and... um. And he promised and begged and promised and begged that it would never happen again. Please don't leave. Please don't call the police. I promise, I promise, I promise. And and I believed him. So my first, you know, recommend, like my first tip that I'd like to give anyone who's listening is, you know, if there's any physical abuse, any, a slap, you know, a choke on the neck, whatever, report it right away to the police. I think there's an option where you don't have to press charges, but report it right away to the police and get a report. Don't just, um, you know, like whatever, don't, don't just say it, like wait for the report and get a copy of the report because that establishes a history. And um, I think if they do it three times, well, I don't know, every place is different, but in New York, if it's three or more times, they can get arrested. So um, anyway, so that's like a big tip. If you're ever physically, don't be embarrassed. I was embarrassed so much. Like my, I feel like my, my shame stopped me from protecting myself. So don't let that happen. Like be smarter, you know, be smart, report it. So anyway, after that, it just, you know, it was just a whole bunch of mess for 10 years after that. Um, when years whatever until I left but it was just horrible it was just um we had a dog he gave he brought me a dog and you know he's smart he knows that like having a family dog will like cement people because later on he did the same thing to the girl that he lived with that he went to live with when I when we got divorced he she lived with her dad she lived with her parents her mom passed away and so she lived with her dad she was somebody we worked with and then he did the same thing. He bought them the same dog as my dog. Mine is a little black toy poodle. He did the same thing. My son told me, oh, dad bought them a, a black poodle, just like my dog's name. And I was like, oh, and I'm like, wow, you see, there's a pattern. Like he knows that that keeps people because now you have a dog together. And anyway, so, um, you know, with the dog, with everything, he never helped with anything. So now here I am doing everything by myself, taking care of the house, taking care of the baby, taking care of my dog, um, working. He was working, but he made always like a lot less than me. This went on for a while. You know, I, on the weekends, he would sleep till like 11, 12. And you know, I, anyone who has children know knows that kids don't sleep that late, especially when they're young. They just don't. So my son would be up 
like as a toddler, like one, two years old, he would be up. And I, you know, I'm always up. I'm like always doing a million things. So I would be up with him, make sure he has breakfast, play with him, keeping him engaged. And he would wake up um, like if we were a little loud. And I don't mean loud. I mean like normal, like, you know, how quiet could you be with a toddler? He would be like, shut up, sleep, and he, like screaming from the room. And so when we bought the house, which we ended up buying a home, um, it was three floors. So we would go, I would be like, shh, come on, let's go in the basement. And like I, when my son would wake up on the weekends, I would be like, shh, we'd go to the basement and then I'd close the door and then I'd play with them because I was terrified of making noise on the weekends because he would just go nuts. Um, and the, the house we bought... Um, we were able to buy it because my family had given me the down payment. So we bought the house. Uh, immediately, he like claimed things in the house. He was like, the basement's mine. It's going to be my man cave. Um, so we weren't allowed. Eventually, we weren't allowed there at all. Like, even if I think I, I mentioned, like, um, I bought paper towels and toilet paper at Costco. Um and I and there's an area like the basement's large. It's as large as the house. So there was an area in the front. I, I know like where he stayed, where he set up his couch and gaming stations and all that. That was on the other side. So on the other side it was completely empty, like completely empty. So I put neatly in a corner, like cubby area. I put the the packages of toilet paper and whatever paper towels. When I went upstairs to do something, put away the laundry, I come back down and there's like thrown across the kitchen are the two packages. And I was like, what's going on? And he was like, this is my area. No one's allowed here and nothing could be stored here. And I was like, oh my God, like this is ridiculous. So I, so I couldn't even use my own basement. You know, like that's usually the area where people store things like bikes or whatever. I couldn't use it for anything. I originally I thought I would do a little playroom for my son. Well, obviously that went out the window. So, so anyway, we couldn't use it at all. He even hated my son's toys being in the living room, you know, on the first floor. And I'm like, he's a toddler. Like, I, like he didn't understand that. He's like, keep it in his room. He has a room, keep the toys in his room. And I'm like, he's a toddler. All right. He's going to, when I cook, he's going to be near me when I'm, you know, doing things, he's going to be with me. And it's, yeah, his toys are going to be around. Like they're not going to, it's not like they were messy. He just didn't want any of his toys around. He he felt he had a room. That's where the toys could be housed. So anyway, you know, things like really got bad quickly once we moved in the house. Um, because he just literally would come home from work, go downstairs, smoke pot, play video games all night. So like two in the morning and then go to bed and repeat the cycle. And here I am cooking, cleaning, work, taking care of my son, taking care of the dog. After a while, it got annoying. Like in the morning, I had to get up at five because I had to, um, this is when my son was now three or four and went to daycare or whatever. No, it's called preschool, preschool. I um, when I had to get up. I had to make him lunch for the day, like in snacks. Then I had to walk my dog. Then I had to feed my dog. Then I had to take a shower, get dressed for work. Then come back down, walk my dog again. Like do all this and then bring my son to, to daycare or preschool and then go to work. And all he has to do is get up, take a shower, go to work. Like he never helps with anything. And so after a while of doing this, I was like, I need help. Like you have to at least walk my dog, like in the mor our dog in the morning. And he would get annoyed, like, Ugh, like, why can't I do it all? And I'm like, well, anyway. And then he would have his poker games still in the basement, but the guys would come up to use the restroom and it was just smoking and loud. And so I started going to my mom's those nights because I didn't want my son, you know, he couldn't sleep. They were loud. It was still three in the morning, you know, guys coming up, down, drunk, stoned. I was just like, yeah, I don't want to really be here. So that started happening. He was all too happy, you know, for me to have a place to go because he felt like, you know, that teenager that has the house to themselves. So um, basically, you know, we, we, we passed more years like this. I was miserable. He was trying to control everything, where we went, who, who we went on the holidays. If I would want to go to my family, he would say, well, because my mom was the main, was 
taking care of my son two days a week. And then we had a babysitter three days a week. This is a little bit before pre, I mean, the year before daycare. And um, he would be like, well, since your mom watches him two days a week, there's no reason why we should go to your family's for any holidays because she sees him enough. So the holidays will be with my family. And I'm like, what? Like, I couldn't even stay with my family because he felt they saw him enough. Meanwhile, when I started hanging out with him, when we got married and we started going to his family's for different functions, they would always remark that like, oh, wow, we know, we haven't seen him for Christmas for four years before you. We, we've we never seen him for Easter. So it was like, basically, he never hung out with his family before me. All of a sudden now, he just always wanted to go for the holidays there. It was just, and then later on, he didn't want to go to the holidays at his sister's because he would say, you know, she's doing it on purpose. She's hosting on purpose because she wants me to drive all the way to Long Island. And I'm like, what? Like nothing he ever said made much sense. And then he would call himself the common sense guy. He's like, you're the smart one. I'm the common sense one. That's how he would like differentiate us all the time. Um, and in my head, I was like, you really don't have common sense. So I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I didn't really say it, you know? Um, so yeah, that was like a whole bunch of, you know, and then um, we had a few situations where he blew up in front of, you know, people. So one of them was we were at his family's Christmas party um, in Pennsylvania, and his mom asked me if she if we could take her and her husband home. because Sometimes they lived here, like in New York, and six months out of the year, six months somewhere else. So she was like, do you mind if you take us home on the way home? Because usually the daughter does it, but she had to do something else. So I said, yeah, sure, of course. She was like 80-something, you know, by the way. They're not like young parents. They're older because he was, remember, they had like 12-year gap before they had their boys. So, and he's 40. So um, when I told him, he was outside smoking pot with his cousin's um, children and their girlfriends. So like basically with 18 year olds and he's like 42 at this point. <laughs> and, um, and when I told him he went crazy, like he went nuts. He called me every name. He was violent. He was throwing things. And, um, it was just really disgusting because they're his parents, you know? And he was like, I told you, you're not allowed to agree to say anything without passing it through me first. And, and just went crazy. And I was just disgusted with, I, I remember just being really, really disgusted with him that night. And he, he was like, you know what? You're going to take them home, not me. So he made me take him home first. And then I drove his parents home. Like, like it was just insane. Cause you know, imagine it's winter in the middle of the night because, you know, we were there until like eight o'clock and it was far away. So it was like three hour after a three hour drive, I had to drive another hour by myself. <laughs> Like, just really mean, rude, disgusting, low-class stuff, you know? Um, and then an, oh, another time, so then I decided that I was going to go back to school to get my master's because, you know, when you have children, you're always looking at, like, how you can make their lives better. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go get my master's. This way I could, you know, get, get a better position at my company because they, I had my eye on a position and I knew that if I had my master's, it would be like a, kind of a shoe in So I, and my job paid, you know, was paying for it. If you get A's, they pay for it. If you get B's, they pay a little less, et cetera. So I, I did it at night and on the weekends virtually. And it was a lot of work. I think I only had to go in once a month in person because the, the school was in New York City. So, it, or twice a month, yeah, because I would go after work because it was right near my job. So I was like basically killing myself at this point because, again, I told you already, I got up at five in the morning to take care of everything. Now I'm getting up at five, but now I'm going to bed at like two or three, you know, because now I have to stay up to do my homework. And you can't do it with a child. So I couldn't do it until my son went to bed, the dishes were done, you know, the dog is done, everyone's done for the night and sleeping, and then I would get on my computer and start doing my schoolwork. So one Saturday, my son had soccer. He was like four years old at this point. And, um, and I, I, you know, of course, I had to do that too on the weekends because he, he was the king who slept till 11, 12. 
So one Friday night, he was coming up from his, you know, playing of video games and pot smoking in the basement. And it was like three in the morning. Or, and he was like, oh, you're crazy. You're still up. You're crazy. And I was like, yeah, I have to do my schoolwork. And I said to him, can you please do me a favor and take him to soccer? Because I have two reports due this weekend. And honestly, I don't know where I'm going to find the time. And he was like, no. And like with a straight face, he didn't feel bad for me. He didn't say, oh, because I have something going on. He said, no. He looked me right in the eyes and he was like, you signed him up, you take him. And he went back upstairs and went to bed. And I started crying that night. And in my heart, I knew that I would get a divorce if things didn't change because I, I was like, wow, that's freaking cold. You know what I mean? Like, you see what I'm doing you with your own eyes. It's not like I'm you know, um, what's that word? Gaslighting you. Like he gaslighted me with everything. But he had no qualms to just look at me straight, cold face and said, no. Like when you're a partner with somebody, you care about them, you know, and wherever you could help, you help. I mean, especially if you're um, enjoying the perks too, you know, because like he, with his position, we could have never had the house. We could never, you know. So like he didn't even think of any of that. It was just like, nope. So anyway, life went on in a horrible way for me. Um, everything was, I was, we're, we're, me, now me and my son are walking on eggshells for everything. If we want to go somewhere, it's like, no. Oh, we, you, you want to go out and look at the Christmas lights, the houses? No. You want to, you know, no. Um, he'd be mad if you you included him because he didn't want to do it. And then mad if you didn't include him and did it without him. It was like, there was literally like no right or wrong way to do anything because anything we did, there was a problem. Um, and it's just like, again, it went on like that for a while, really unhappy. Oh, there, there were a few more times in between that, two more times where he put his hands on me. So now I was getting really frustrated and I was scared for my son because I'm smart enough to know that the reason why I deal with or dealt with a lot of that stuff was because of my abuse and my witnessing of the abuse of my mom when I was young. So I was like, I don't want this for my son. I don't want this for my son. I, want, I don't want my son to ever think it's okay to hit a woman. I don't want my son to ever think it's okay. He got in the habit of speaking very badly to me, constantly cursing at me, calling me a bitch, calling me selfish. We had a big fight because his parents, you know, came for one of the birthdays and we only have like one big you know, bed, our bed. And then we had um, like a little twin rollout bed, like it rolls out under or whatever. Um, in the room, we have like a tiny room that's just a third bedroom that nobody uses. And then in my son's room, there was just his full-size bed. Um, so I had suggested to him, why don't we give your parents our bed? And you could, he always slept downstairs smoking pot anyway on his, because he got himself a beautiful leather couch that opened all, reclined all the way out. So I was like, why don't you sleep down there? And I'll just sleep in that twin bed. Um, and he was like, no, I have a bed. Back. We had gotten a special mattress. It was expensive um, because he claimed he had a bad back. So he was like, no, I have a bad back. I have to sleep on my mattress. And his father's like 84 and like had, two uh, quadruple bypass surgeries by that time. So I was like, I don't think it's smart for your dad to sleep on a rollout twin bed that's close to the floor. Like, it's really bad. I don't think so. And he was like, well, too bad. He goes, you never think about me. You only think about other people. I can't believe you. You're so selfish. You make me sick. You're so selfish. You don't care about me at all. Me, my bad back. And I'm like, wow, I'm caring about your dad, you know? And all he did was call me all these names, selfish bitch, selfish bitch. I don't care anything about him. I always care about everyone else. I always take everyone else's side. I never think about him. So it's just like this. And like, I, you know, like fast forward to when, when it was during COVID, um, I just was getting tired of it. And I was really concerned, growing more and more concerned of my son hearing it. Because now my son's eight. He's not a, like a baby anymore. And I was like, you know what? I think I have to leave if he doesn't get help. So I did offer him help. I told him we can go to therapy. We did, by the way, throughout these 10 years, we did go to therapy. He he appeased me once or twice. But every time we went, he would an excuse would come up. The first time we went, 
he said, the lady liked me and is my friend. I'm like, what? Like, I don't know this lady from Adam, but somehow she was my friend and took my side because of that. Okay. So I even found a Hispanic male therapist because he's Hispanic male. So I thought, okay, maybe he needs to relate to the therapist. So I did all my due diligence to find somebody who was in my insurance plan, who was a Hispanic male. And we go to him and he's like, oh, he likes you. He thinks you're pretty and he's siding with you. I was like, what? Like, I, 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 I couldn't believe it. Like, it just, so basically it doesn't matter what you do. He's going to find a reason or an excuse. So it was just like pointless. But now at this time, I gave him the option. I said, listen, things are not working out. Like, this is horrible. So this is not what I envisioned of a marriage. You know, you're always downstairs doing your thing, smoking pop, playing your video games, um, watching TV, whatever you do down there. We're not allowed there. You know, this is my house. I paid for it mostly, and I can't even go down there. Like, I do all the work. I'm doing this. I'm just, I really need you to get into therapy. Otherwise, this is not going to work. You threaten me. You hit me here and there. I don't hit you. I'm like, you did. You hit me like at least four or five times. I never touched you. Oh, that's not hitting. Because he never, like, once he slapped me, once he put his, he, he was big. So he put his big hands over my nose and mouth and squeezed it, like, to choke, like, to not make me breathe. And the only reason why he let go is um, we were in a car and the person crossing the street was, like, screaming. And he got scared because they, they were scared. And anyway, so, but he doesn't think of any of those times as hitting me because if you don't have a big black eye, you're not, you know, hit. There's no abuse. So he was like, no, nope, I don't want to go to therapy. Get a divorce. I don't care. So I um, I was, you know, so now I was kind of like ready for it. But anyway, that night or the next day, we had plans to paint the outside of the house. So it was hot in summer. I was up early. I did everything I had to do with the dog, my son. I set my son up with a little pool. I had all the painting supplies. I thought maybe if we do this together, we could talk things out, you know, maybe see if he wants to go to therapy, see the importance. He did. He got up at like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, as usual, took a shower. He ate nice and comfortable. Then all of a sudden he comes in the backyard, like all dressed up, smelling like cologne. I thought he was going to help me paint. That was the point. And he's like, yeah, I'll be back. I'm going to, I'm going to go out. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so anyway, he went out. Um, you know, I did what I, you know, stuff with my son and whatever. And then that night when everyone was sleeping, I went to clean the bathroom and I see all these like little pubic hairs everywhere. So it made me understand he preened himself, which he hadn't done in years. So I was like, oh God, this guy's cheating on, on top of everything, this guy's cheating on me. I was like, this wonderful, you know? So I called him. I was so angry. And so I just, you feel so disrespected. You know what I mean? Like everything I do. And, and this is, you know, and, and during that time, by the way, he, um, he was with, um, at work, he was always hanging out with his boss. So that's why cheating thing immediately came to my head because I would always see them in the lunchroom, like every single day I would go get coffee and there they were like hanging out. And, um, I had earlier, I had, um, approached him about it and I told him that it looked really bad and it was very disrespectful to me because everyone knew us as a married and everyone's talking now at work because they see you guys like inseparable. And he was like, you're crazy. She's my supervisor. You're nuts. She's my boss. You're crazy. You're nuts. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're jealous. And I'm not a jealous type. It's just, it's not in my blood. I'm the type that's like, oh, you don't, you know, you want something else? Go for it. Like, I really don't care. But, um, <clears throat> but he painted me out to be jealous. I wasn't jealous. I was, I felt disrespected because again, this is my workplace. I had a better position than him. So I was, and I'm very serious when it comes to work, like very serious, seriously. So I felt like, wow, it's very rude, you know, because people know us as married. And then all of a sudden, like they see you always with, you know, with this girl. So anyway, but he had denied everything. So now cut back to the night with the hair and me calling him. That's what I had in my mind, that he was with her. 
So he was like, no, I even, I think I even said her name. I was like, I think you're with, you know, so-and-so. And he was like, no, you're nuts. You're nuts. Anyway, I had told him again that I was going to go for divorce. He comes home and he's like, I bought a car. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I bought a car and we needed a second car. But I had envisioned he had a road beater. We had one nice car and one road beater because he always had to go golfing on the weekends. Um, he had to go um, gamble on the weekends. He was a big gambler. So he needed his little car because he would he would literally stop me and my son from doing things. He would stop me from taking my son to soccer because he needed the car to go to Atlantic City, you know. So that's when he had gotten the road beater. The road beater died a couple of years later and he needed we, we needed to replace it. But it was like it just died like the day before. And we didn't discuss yet how we were going to replace it. I envisioned we were going to replace it with another like, you know, used car, like a $2,000 car just for him to get from point A to B. But instead, he bought a brand new Honda, you know, LX or whatever, like luxury version with leather seats and like totally spent all the money that we had. And he didn't lease it. He bought it cash. He spent all the money we had in our bank account. Like that was all we had saved, that and maybe $5,000. So I was just like, oh my God, like this guy's nuts, you know? Like, no, I said, how could you buy a car without discussing it with me? And he was like, I don't have to discuss anything with you. And like, that's the minute I knew, like, I said to myself, get a divorce. This is not going to get any better at all. So I Googled, um, you know, divorce attorneys. I had him served within that week. He like went ballistic. He went nuts, called me every name in the book. And then all of a sudden, like, was Dr. Jekyll. And then all of a sudden, I was, like, happy and laughing. Like, yeah, I don't care. I don't care. Do you think I care? I don't care. I have another girl. What do I care about you? I already have my next person. And I'm like, fine, whatever. You know, it is what it is. I'm getting a divorce. So then when it became a reality, the divorce, the focus was on the money. You know, he was very greedy. He wanted all the money. He was like, sell the house. He was like, sell the house. Give me 50%. And that's all I want. And I'm like, excuse me? I was like, my my family gave me the down payment for this house. Like, I have to give that back to them. They definitely don't want you to have that. That's for sure. You know, and he was like, no, 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 that's not like an option. He's like, I need the money and you're going to have to give me, sell the house, give me half. And then I don't care what you do. He, he, he only requested every other weekend with my son. He never requested anything else. So... Um, but because, and then he had a friend who was a, an injury attorney, like an ambulance chaser type of an attorney, and he used him because he was his high school buddy. He forced him to do it for free. And so he didn't have to pay anything, but I ended up having to pay a ton of money to an attorney, but I was able to get my deposit back. Um, and then we agreed that um, I could buy him out by giving him some money in cash and then the rest he took from our retirement that we did together, which was a lot, a significant amount of, about amount of money. But they do a formula to, like, tell you what it's worth today. So between that and the cash, I was able to buy him out legally. However, in his mind, he just gave me the house because he thinks that, you know, I didn't give him anything and whatever. And um, and it's just been like a horrible, I mean, there there was a lot of stuff in between, obviously, like it was horrible until he left, um, the judge gave him. So because our attorneys ultimately came to an agreement, my attorney told me, he advised me agreeing because he said the courts in New York are very skewed in the direction of the fathers. And he said, if you don't accept this agreement, then you're really going to have someone else judge to like make a decision for the rest of your life. He said it can go your way, which we all thought it was because the judge hated him and hated his attorney because they really made a mockery of the entire system. Um, they were pulled aside many times, like multiple times, both of them. Um, but um, my attorney convinced me to take the deal. My family still is mad at me about it. Because they said the judge hated him. Why would you take a deal? And I was like, I don't know. 
Like when you have an attorney telling you, this is the advice I give you, like that's what I'm paying for is to give me advice. So I, I, I don't know. I just, it was a bad time. Again, first time I never dealt with attorneys. So I, I, I took it. And when you make an agreement, the judge cannot really make any changes to the agreement because like he now has nothing to do with it because it's between you two. But he said he could make one change, which was how fast he has to move out. So he said, I see you. He goes, don't think I don't know you. I know your game. I see what you're doing to this young woman. He goes, so I can't, I don't agree with her for taking this agreement. He goes, but I will make one change instead of giving you, because we gave him 30 days to evacuate the premises. Um, if he found something and if it, and if he couldn't find something up to three months. So the that's what my attorney gave. But the judge changed it to one week. Like he hated him. He was like, I, I he, he called his number and he was like, I see what you're doing. You're playing games. You're wasting her time. You're using, you know, to stay in the home. He's like, you're out one week. So later on, he ended up telling everyone he spread malicious rumors at me about me at work. He told everyone I was sleeping around. I cheated on him. He had to divorce me. I was so cruel. I gave him one week to get out. Like none of it was true. Um, he even said that I slept around so much he wasn't sure that the child was his, knowing damn well it wasn't biologically his. Um, but he pretended that I never told him that. Like it was really bad. And because of that, like because he spread that particular rumor that I never told him I used donor sperm, I tricked him. Um, I was able to do another lawsuit for um, defamation because the people he was telling were my colleagues, you know, and it was ruining my reputation at work, which, you know, could hurt my ability to, you know, get better positions and make it, you know, my my life. Um, and I won that. I didn't ask for money in that case, but I asked for him for, it's called a truth statement. So I have the truth that he knew. He knew that he was lying when he spread those rumors about me. So I have that in case I ever need it for like a future court thing, because only God knows what else he's going to put me through. So now it's like I'm living a life of sharing shared custody with someone who doesn't even want my son. Like when he was here, he was never with my son. He was always in the basement smoking pot. On the weekends, he was playing golf with his friends, gambling, never went to a baseball game, never went to a soccer game, like didn't care about anything like that. All of a sudden now he wants my son because he knows it's hurting me. He knows that, like he's not stupid. And he has such little power and control over my life that this is the last place where he has the control and he is using it to his fullest advantage, you know? Um, so he gets every other weekends and holiday and like two weeks in the summer. And and it's always torture. Every week it's a different torture. You know, he won't allow my son to continue his activities when it falls on his days. If if we, you know, bitch and moan about it enough, um, if it's an important soccer game or if it's an important like birthday party with his friends, he'll allow it. But it's like he's doing me a favor. He calls me and he's like, well, I'm doing you a favor. So you're going to have to pick him up take him to the party and then take him back and then give me the time that he missed from being at the party. Like, it's just every, every day is torture. Nobody knows why I, you know, like why I do it because I'm the custodial parent. They're like, Oh, just say no. Well, I'm terrified <laughs> that he will go back to court and request more time and maybe get like a three and a half day each. And I cannot tolerate that. So I'm, I'm trying to do what I can um, so that we don't end up back in courts because, again, the courts are completely skewed at this point for the fathers because maybe of years of being on the mom's side. I don't know. I don't know what the right reason is, but that's what it is. It's like they will give the dads all the rights right now and the mothers none unless they're like drug addicts or something. You know what I mean? Unless there's a reason for it. So... Yep. <laughs> so now that we're at this point and you're going to have to deal with them until, you know, your child is 18 years old and or, you know, your child might at one point be like, I'm not going there anymore. But 
for you after dealing with all of this, how are you doing and you know, what have you been doing to help you as far as self-care and recovering and also discuss the difficulty. You were already a single mom, but now you're a single mom with someone who's really counter-parenting against you. So how has that experience been and, and how is the healing process? Yeah, so I've been, you know, I, I'm in therapy. I have a therapist. Um, we do it virtually once a week and I actually found somebody I really like recently. I had somebody who I felt like was just not like, very passive, wasn't like probably doing her nails while we were talking, you know, like not listening. So now I found like an active um, listener who gives me great suggestions uh, to work on myself. And my healing process, it's been two years. And believe it or not, it's like, I feel like I'm just starting my healing process. I think for two years, I was just stuck in this like weird mode of like shell shock, hurt, despair, um, You know, I was terrified every time my son went there on the weekends because of all the horrible things he's done. They were really heinous, you know, and I would think like maybe there's something mentally wrong with him. Like that's what the thought process for me was like, I don't think a human being could do these things unless there's something mentally wrong with them. So then I would start thinking he smokes pot, he drinks, there's something mentally wrong with him. And now he has my son with him. You know, so I I was terrified, like so scared. I mean, one time my son called me from, you know, he called me. And when I answered, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm in the car. I'm like, well, where's, where's your dad? And he's like, oh, he's in the store. Like he left my son in the car. He was only eight, like by himself. I, I was, I was so upset, you know, but of course, when, when I spoke to him about it, he was like, um, Oh, please give me a break. It was only for 10 minutes. You know what? That's all it takes. Two years were pure torture and stress. Um, Things are starting to settle now. My son is older. He's smart. He's very vocal. Um, I've taught him all these years to just protect himself, all different ways to protect himself. He has a phone. He knows I'm always there for him. Um, You know, it's sad because it's my child, but I don't have... Like the courts, I see how, like, it's very scary when someone else makes a decision for the rest of your life. It's very, very scary to me. You know, you get a great judge, wonderful. You get an asshole and you're fucked. You know what I mean? It's like that simple. So, um, so it's, so it took two years for me to get to this point of, of, of like starting to heal. So I'm starting to heal now. I'm going, I found a great therapist. I'm going to start getting back to like, I used to really be into hiking and yoga. So I'm starting to get back into that slowly. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm really cognizant of my son's mental health. So I really don't show him any of this because I don't want him to have problems because of this. This was our fault. And, you know, so I remind him that he's very loved and it, and it hurts me it hurts me to sometimes say like, we love you, mommy, daddy, love you, because I'm like, I can't stand him. And I don't think anything about him is love. I know he's doing this to hurt me and get back at me. I know that, but I don't want him to feel any of that, you know? So I don't show him any of those things. I just tell him that, you know, a lot of people divorce because he said to me like, oh, I'm kind of sad that we're not a family. And I said to him, you know, you're not the only one, like 50% of people are divorced. So you're not the only child of divorce. So don't make it so traumatic. It is what it is. It's better this way. You know, you're, you're, you're not witnessing fights and, and, and bad words and ugly things this way. This way, you know, everything is better. Um, so, yeah, it's like it's, it's, it's a day by day thing. And if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening, what would they be? So, you know, don't doubt your inner voice. If your voice is telling you that something's not right, the way someone's treating you, um, speak to somebody that you trust about it and see what they say. Um, 
recovery is a process. You're not going to get better right away. Like it's probably going to take me five years to fully recover. Um, if there's any physical abuse, report it. You know, do not not report it. It's a huge, huge thing for you, for your future. It's very, very important. And um, and don't hide who they are. I always hid who he was. I made him sound like, you know, when my mother would be like, why are you doing that? Why are you by yourself? Why is it? I would always be like, oh, you know, like make excuses and make him look like a decent person. You know, do not hide who they are. If you don't like, you know, there's no reason to hide who someone is. You know what I mean? Like, if you love them, you know, show who they are, like warts and all. And if the warts are just warts, then nobody's going to care. Everyone's going to go, all right, that's her cup of tea, but not a big deal. But if you don't hide who they are, you know, and people who love you start to see that, they'll warn you, you know, and they'll let you know, like, this is not right. You shouldn't be in this. This is really bad for you. But if you're always hiding it for them, you know, and also keep your finances separate. He forced me to have to put my my uh, paycheck into one account, and he was the sole, um, you know, owner of that account. He was the one who, who made all the transactions um, to the point where he told me I couldn't buy raspberries for my son because they were too expensive. But yet he was, you know, buying cigarettes and marijuana and alcohol. Um, so definitely, you know, keep finances separate. It doesn't mean that you're not married. It just means that you're making wise choices. Um, maybe there's a time, a time will come where you want to keep them together. But definitely for the first five years of marriage, I think people should keep them separate. And so, uh, yeah, same thing as people. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's basically it. I was just reading my notes. <laughs> well, Carmela, I really want to thank you for being here with me today, with everyone today. What everyone doesn't know is this is your second time doing this recording because I erased your previous recording by my by mistake and I, I really apologize uh for that and coming back here on such short notice to do this again so just a really big thank you for sharing your story you know uh, really pointing out the things that you wanted people to learn from your story and you know you just did a really great job and I just can't thank you enough uh for validating people's experiences and, you know, you're going to help a lot of people. So just a big thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you, Brandon. Thank you for doing this show. It's very helpful to, you know, women, not only for validating, but also like getting tips, like, you know, um, tips with the courts, tips with, you know, recording things if, if, if violence happens. These things are important. And I hope whoever's listening, if they're in the situation that, you know, they're like they're still in it. I hope they take everyone's comments because it's really there to help them. Well, thank you, Carmela, once again for being our guest today on our Survivor Story episodes. If people want to be a guest like Carmela was today, go to her website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. At top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our guest form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also, at our website, we have a support group. So if you need support, we have a support group by clicking on the support group button at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. It's a wonderful group of people on there. And you can make a lot of friends, too. So if you need support, join our support group today. And we have friends of the show called Shelter Movers, everyone. Sheltermovers.com. What they do is they help you move all of your stuff from your home into storage. And that can be your pets and livestock, too. So if you're trying to get out of domestic violence and courts of control and you need help leaving the home, getting all of your stuff out of the home, sheltermovers.com can help you get all of your stuff into storage, including your pets and livestock too. It's in Canada only. It is a donor supported charitable organization. So if you need help from them or want to donate to them, go to sheltermovers.com. 
And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org, at domesticshelters.org. They have articles and resources to help you make sense of everything that you're dealing with. And they have every phone number, email address, web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you're in. Domesticshelters.org has it there. So if you need extra support, please do go to domesticshelters.org. And that is it for today's episode. So for myself and Carmela, we hope you have a good night.